أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Mu'mineen wa mu'minat, brothers and sisters, I extend my condolences to you in these nights of the month of Muharram, the nights on which the lovers and the followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt salam gather together to commemorate the tragedy of our master Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And we must remember that in these nights more than anyone in the world the one who is grieving the most, the one who is full of the most sorrow and tears is the master of our age, Sahibul Asri wa Zaman Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. So we must remember him in these nights and send him our condolences as well. The Holy Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam has said, Hussein no minni wa ana min Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. This is a very widely narrated saying of the Holy Prophet of Islam and there's no question about its truth. The only question is what is its meaning? The Prophet says that Hussein, his grandson, is from me and I am from Hussein. When the Prophet said this, he is not saying this to emphasize or to establish his blood relationship with Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When he said this to the people around him, obviously they already knew that the Prophet is the grandfather and Imam Hussein alayhi salam is the grandson. So they already know the family relationship that exists between them. So when the Prophet says this, he is explaining a completely different dimension and relationship and connection that exists between them. Imam Hussein alayhi salam follows the Prophet and he is one of the Imams, one of the divinely appointed successors after the Prophet. Imam Hussein follows the Prophet and the Prophet endorses and announces Imam Hussein alayhi salam as one of the successors after him chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as an Imam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam carries on the same duties and the same mission of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam as the absolute authority of Islam in the world with the exception that Imam Hussein Alaihi Wasallam is not a Prophet. Other than not being a Prophet, all of the same duties that the Prophet has, the Imams, the successors, the leaders after him, they take on those same tasks and responsibilities. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he has this rank because of his absolute obedience to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Imam Hussein always obeyed the Prophet. He never disobeyed the Prophet. He never argued with him. He never disagreed with him. He never questioned him. He never tried to compromise on something in Islam about him on something with Islam. He never imagined that anything that the Prophet said or commanded would be anything less than the best for mankind. 
This is the attitude of Imam Hussein alayhi salam towards the Holy Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So therefore the Prophet says, Husseinu minni wa ana min Hussein. That Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Now is it possible that the Prophet could also say about us that they are from me, that the believers are from me? Of course, we are not able to reach the rank of an Imam. This is of course impossible for us. But in our own limited way, it is possible for us to be of the group of people that the Prophet ﷺ could say that these believers, they are from me. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, where he says, فَمَن تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, whoever follows me, whoever obeys me, whoever listens to my commandments, فَمَن تَبِعَنِي whoever follows me, فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي then verily that person is from me. So if we want to be counted among that special group of people where the Prophet can say فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي then we must have absolute obedience, absolute loyalty, absolute submission to the Holy Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And whether we are from the Prophet depends on that level of obedience and loyalty that we have to him. And how faithfully we follow him depends on what we believe about him and how much we believe in him. If we want to be about that group of people that the Prophet says, فَإِنَّهُ minni," That they are from me, then we have to have a certain level of obedience and submission and loyalty to him. And in order to have that level of obedience to the Prophet, that, so that we can have that high rank with him, then we have to have the proper mentality, the proper attitude and idea about who the Prophet of Islam is, what is his nature, what we should think about him. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he is a prophet, meaning that he is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to receive revelation and then to deliver that revelation to mankind. But the prophet is also a human being. And as we know from our own experiences and the experiences of those around us, human beings sin. They disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So knowing these two things about him, that he is a prophet, and that he is a human being, there are some questions that come up which must be analyzed and they must be understood and answered. So, one of the questions is that since he is a prophet chosen by God, does this mean that we must always obey him in every circumstance and every condition? Next, since he is a human being, is it possible for him to sin in the same way that we sin? And thirdly, since he is a prophet and we must follow him in all conditions and since he is a human and human beings make mistakes, if he is able to make mistakes and sin like we do, do we have to follow him in the sins and the mistakes that he commits? So these are some questions that must be understood. So what we believe about the nature of the prophet will affect how we follow him and it will affect how what we think about our religion. So if the Prophet, this is a hypothetical question, we are not saying that this is reality, we are bringing this question up in order to analyze it and consider it so that we can answer it properly. So we are saying that if the Prophet sins, there are some questions that must be answered. One, if the Prophet sins, how could we accept all of his words in matters of belief, of aqidah? Like what we say about the afterlife, none of us have seen anything of the afterlife. So the only thing we know about the afterlife is based on the word of the Prophet. So if he sins, how can we trust his words about belief such as things about the afterlife? If he sins, how can we obey him in all circumstances? If he sins, how can we be confident that he has brought the Qur'an to us properly? How can we be confident that this Qur'an that we have is truly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If the Prophet sins, how can we trust in the Islamic laws that he teaches us 
when the very person who was teaching us the Islamic law is breaking the Islamic law. And if the Prophet sins, is it possible for him to command us and order us to also sin? So these are questions that must be analyzed. So the first thing we should understand about these questions is that these questions are only valid if the Prophet sins. If the Prophet does not sin, then all of these questions are irrelevant, they are baseless, they have no foundation whatsoever. So how we view the Prophet, how we view his nature, determines how we follow him, and it determines how we define Islam. In our day, what do we know about Islam? What do we think about Islam? It all depends on what we think about the Prophet. For example, there are some people who say, and they argue, that the Prophet ﷺ, he was just like any other regular man whose choices were influenced by the culture, society, and the times in which he lived. The people that were around him, they influenced his thinking, they influenced his behavior, and the things that he did were a result of all of those things within his environment. So therefore, the teachings which he taught were also influenced by these things. And therefore, since today's modern society has advanced far beyond what 7th century Arabia was used to, what was common to them, many of the things that he taught back then are no longer relevant today. So this is the argument. So they say that what he taught then was based on his environment and since the environment has changed today that a lot of those teachings are no longer relevant to our society. And on a personal level what we think about the Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi wasallam, plays a big part in what we think about our own personal responsibility to Islam. If we believe that the Prophet is perfect if we believe that he is sinless, then we will stand strong in our religion no matter what critics say. No matter what anyone says in attacking Islam, we will stand firm. If we believe that the Prophet is the perfect and sinless medium between Allah and us and that he has delivered the Quran perfectly, then we will have confidence that this is actually the revelation of Allah, that from the first letter to the last, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken. And if we believe that he is infallible, we will follow him with full confidence and without any objection. And even if we do not follow him perfectly, at least we will have this attitude. We will say that he should be followed. Even if I'm not following him perfectly myself, I will admit that he should be followed. And I will try to improve myself so that I follow him perfectly. But if we believe that he is not ma'asum, that he is not infallible, that he is able to commit sins, then we would accept the possibility that some parts of the religion are incorrect. If the Prophet sins, then we would have to look for places in order to correct him. We would have to verify his teachings. Because if he makes mistakes, we have to make sure that what he is giving us is correct. So we have to check it. So therefore, the judge of what is right or wrong will be us, the community, and not Allah. If the Prophet sins. If he sins, it would be very easy for the critics of Islam, those who attack Islam, to weaken our faith. So now how should we analyze these questions? The answer to these questions can be found through two tests. We can put them through two examinations, two ways to look at them. We can call them the test of revelation and the test of reasoning. One is the test of aql and one is the test of wahi. So the test of reasoning determines which of these arguments makes sense rationally. Number one, does it make sense that God would choose a prophet who is con consistently righteous and does not commit any sins. Does this make sense? Or does it make sense that God would choose someone as a prophet who is a sinner and then tell, tell us to have, command us to have absolute obedience to this person who is a sinner? Which one of these two makes sense? So, this test of reasoning can be answered by having a proper understanding of God. A proper understanding of our Creator because after all, it is Allah who chooses the prophets, it is Allah who sends the revelation, it is Allah who sends us the religion. Allah has absolute knowledge, Allah has absolute wisdom. Allah does not do anything that is less than perfect. And He does not command anything that is less than perfect. So if Allah is perfect and His book is perfect, why would he choose an imperfect medium to deliver his perfect book? 
this would be unwise this would not be based on knowledge so since we know that Allah is absolutely knowledgeable and that he is absolutely wise we know that he would not send his perfect book with an imperfect messenger number one number two we also believe that God is just as part of our usuluddin we say that one of the sub beliefs of Tawheed is Adil we believe that Allah is just that he does not commit any zulm or oppression to his creation so since we say that Allah is just, we say that Allah does not set up his creation for failure. He does not create a situation where his creation would fail. What does this mean? This means that God does not put us in a situation where we are stuck in a contradiction. For example, Allah has given us the ability to do certain things and not certain other things. For example, we have the ability with our physical bodies and our minds to do some things, but we are not capable of doing everything. We can walk and we can run, but we can't fly without the use of some external equipment. So we have certain limitations upon us. So knowing this, we say that it will be unjust for Allah to create us with certain limits and then command us to do something which is beyond our limits. It's like someone manufacturing somebody making a car that has a maximum speed of 100 miles per hour and then expecting that car to go a thousand miles per hour this is setting up for a contradiction setting something up for failure we say that this is unjust and this is a contradiction and this is unwise and therefore it cannot be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise if Allah were to choose a person as a sinner to be a prophet we say that this would lead to a contradiction. Why do we say this? We say that if we obey a sinning prophet, then we also obey him in his sins. Because when Allah sends a prophet, he tells us to obey him in all conditions. So if this prophet is a sinner, then we also have to obey him in his sin. So this creates a contradiction. If we obey the prophet, then we disobey Allah if we follow him in the sin. But if we don't obey the prophet in the sin, then we have disobeyed Allah who commanded us to obey the prophet. So it's creating this circular contradiction. It is creating this situation where no matter what we do, we are ending up as sinners. We are ending up as disobeying Allah. So is it wise for Allah to create a situation where he commands us to disobey him? So this is not the way of the wise creator. So it is impossible that Allah would command us to have absolute obedience. It is impossible that Allah would tell us to follow a sinner. A prophet must be free from sin, he must be free from disobeying Allah, he must be free from making mistakes so that we can obey him without any risk or fear of sinning ourselves. Next, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to have absolute obedience to the prophet, this is only possible if we have absolute trust in the prophet. How can Allah tell us to obey this person if we do not trust him or if we do not have any reason to trust him we know that the holy prophet of islam sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam lived for 40 years among his people and earned their trust before allah gave him the mission of prophethood so that they could have absolutely no excuse to not believe his words if someone has sinned in the past we would always be suspicious that this person might sin in the future so Allah cannot choose this type of person because the knowledge of religion is not like the knowledge of science that we can go out through our study and through our effort and discovery we can find out and learn these things for ourselves. The knowledge of religion contains things that no matter how hard we try we will never be able to find out for ourselves. This is the knowledge of the unseen. This is the knowledge of morality. This is the knowledge of the afterlife. This is the knowledge of what is to come in the future. These things we cannot know ourselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must reveal these things to us. So when he reveals these things, they must be revealed to a person that we can turn to and we can trust. We can put our confidence in this person and say that this person has never betrayed us. This person has never misguided us this person has never lied or cheated this person has never committed a sin that we could think about therefore this person can have our absolute trust so a prophet is responsible for delivering the revelation so if he sins then how can we know that what he has given us is the word of Allah 
For example, if someone is known as a thief, can that person be in control of our money? So if someone has lied in the past, how can this person be in control of what is considered the revelation from Allah? How do we know that this person is not going to just lie and make up something and say this is revelation from Allah? Where he says that Allah has commanded that all of you should be my slaves, that all of you should give me half of your wealth. That no matter what I do, you should never disobey me. Even if I oppress you, even if I hurt you, even if I kill your people or torture you, you should never disobey me. If this person is a sinner, how can we trust that he would not say things like this? So the person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends as his prophet, as the one who delivers the revelation, as the one who teaches us the religion, he can never have made a sin or a mistake in the past in order that we can trust him. So a prophet must be free from sin and error so that we can put our absolute trust in him that everything he brings is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there are some who say, that it is the nature of the human being to sin. Human beings sin by nature and therefore it is impossible for a human being to be sinless. It is impossible for a person to avoid sin at all times. But if we consider why somebody sins, what are the reasons that a person disobeys Allah, we realize that avoiding sin at all times, it might be difficult but it is not impossible if we analyze what are the reasons for these sins. For example, people sin for various reasons. Number one, a person might sin out of ignorance. A person does not know that something is wrong, that something is a sin, that something is a disobedience to Allah, and he or she performs that action. Or a person sins out of forgetfulness. They forget that something is a sin. Or a person sins out of indifference. A person says, I don't care if something is right or wrong, so the person never bothers to learn what is moral and what is immoral, never bothers to learn what is right or what is wrong and just lives their lives in whatever way that they want. Or a person sins because of a lack of willpower. A person knows that something is wrong but their desires overpower their reasoning and so they sin based on that. Or a person sins because they seek the pleasure of someone other than Allah. They know that something is wrong, but they say, well, if I don't commit this sin, then my family or my friends are going to be displeased with me and I have to keep them happy. So they choose their pleasure instead of Allah's pleasure. Or a person will sin in order to achieve a certain goal. They know that something is wrong, but they do it because they think that this is the only way to get ahead. Well, if I don't go to this party with alcohol and drink with everyone else, my boss is not going to give me this promotion. So they use this excuse. They know it's wrong, but they do it anyway to achieve a goal. Or a person sins because they derive pleasure from that sin. Or a person sins because they justify that sin as something good. For example, a person will deny that something is a sin. For example, they'll deny that abortion or racism is a sin and they'll try to justify it as something allowed and good. Or they will justify a sin as something of unavoidable. They say, I couldn't avoid it, there's no other way that it could have happened. How many innocent people have been killed around the world and then their death, deaths have been called collateral damage. They say we were trying to kill this person and we know it was a crowded place and we had to drop the bomb anyway because we had to kill this terrorist. And they kill innocent people around them. Or they justify a sin as necessary. They say that an evil is necessary in order to preserve a greater good. So we're going to kill 100,000 people because it might save a million people. So we know that if we drop this atomic bomb on these two cities, it's going to kill hundreds of thousands of people, but it's going to prevent a war that possibly saves a million lives. So they use these excuses. Or a person sins because they forget Allah. More than anything else, this is one of the reasons why someone sins because they forget their Lord. They forget that they are under the dominion and the sovereignty and within the kingdom and under the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They think they are free from Allah's rules and obligations, so they perform sins. But if a person eliminates all of these reasons, and they acquire certain traits which we are going to explain, it is possible for that person to avoid most sins 
and it is even possible for that person after a hard road of self-purification and hard work to reach a point where that person no longer sins at all. Number one, that person must have proper knowledge. The knowledge of what is right, the knowledge of what is wrong, what is halal and what is haram. Next, that person must be aware at all times. Their mind must always be on. They must always be thinking in every situation, is this something which is right for me to do is, or is this something which is forbidden for me to perform? The person must have a strong willpower so that even if I know that something is wrong, no matter how much pleasure is in that thing, my willpower and my intellect is stronger than my desire and I control myself. The person must seek only Allah's pleasure. Even if the entire world stands against me, I should obey and seek the pleasure of Allah only. I should have an aversion to evil, meaning that if Allah hates something, I should hate it in my heart as well. And I should submit myself to whatever Allah declares as a sin. If Allah says it's wrong, I should not try to debate, I should not try to compromise, I should not try to find an excuse to do it. I should say, Allah has said it is forbidden, so I should accept that. And I should seek Allah's help at all times. At all times, we should seek help we should seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from our own desires, from shaitan, and from the cunning and tricks of other people. If we can do this, then it is possible that we could be on the road to perfection. All of these traits can be trained and all of these can be improved. If a person is committed and submits to him, himself to Allah with mind, body, and spirit, then it is possible to reach a stage where he avoids all sins. We see that people perform good deeds and people perform bad deeds. They do both. If they do both, it is possible to increase the good and reduce the bad. And they can reduce the bad to a point where reducing the bad becomes a habit and they perform that habit for so long that it becomes a second nature. So today I might commit a sin, but through some hard work, I can stop myself from doing that sin one day, two days, one month, six months, until it becomes a habit to avoid that sin. And then eventually it becomes a second nature that avoiding that sin, I don't even have to think about it anymore. I avoid it instinctively. So we can do the same with all sins. So a person can achieve this goal. And of course, this is only possible with the grace of Allah and His help at every step of the way because it is, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives us the ability to perform righteous actions and to stay away from sinning. So this is the test of reasoning which shows that it is very possible for a person to be sinless and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only chooses a sinless person to be the prophet who delivers his message to mankind. So that is the first test. The second test is the test of revelation. This means that we look into the Quran and we see which one of these arguments is supported by the Quran. Does the Quran support the claim that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is sinless and ma'asum? Or does the Quran command us to have absolute obedience to somebody who disobeys God? But just like the test of reasoning, the test of revelation gives us the exact same result. For example, Allah says, How many times in the Quran have we seen this phrase, or where Allah's obedience is right next to the Prophet's obedience, meaning that they are exactly the same with no condition whatsoever. The same way we follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolutely, we must follow the Prophet absolutely. Or Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Verily you the Prophet are upon the greatest morality. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ that in the Prophet of Allah, you have the best example to follow. Or Allah sets up a comparison between the believers and the Prophet. In one verse he says, That whoever insults or says evil things about Allah and his messenger, then for that person is a curse in this world and punishment in the next world. And then in the next verse it says, that whoever says evil things about the believers without them having earned it. Meaning that for the believers it is possible, alaykum as it is possible that they can sin, but for the Prophet it is absolutely impossible. 
or the Quran makes it very, very easy for us. It makes it very easy. We ask, is the Prophet capable of sinning? Is the Prophet capable of making a mistake? Allah very clearly says, مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى Allah says, your companion, meaning the Prophet, he does not make mistakes, nor can he be led astray. We say, is it possible for someone to trick the Prophet into teaching us something that is incorrect? The Quran says, no. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى We say, does the Prophet ever say something from himself to try to trick us? No, the Quran says, he never speaks from himself. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَى That everything he says, is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or the Prophet himself says, In attabi'u illa ma yuha ilayya. I do not follow anything except what is revealed unto me. So the test of reasoning and the test of revelation, they all confirm that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is completely free from making any type of mistake, from disobeying Allah, from committing any type of sin. And whatever the Prophet commands, Therefore is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the Prophet says something, there's no room for arguing. There's no room for debating with him. There's no room for trying to compromise or justify ourselves in disobeying him. And if we realize this, and if we obey him to the extent that we are capable of obeying him, and we ask for the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is possible that we can be of that group of people that Ibrahim alayhi salam says about them, فَمَنْ تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي So those who follow me, that they are from me. That the, When the Prophet says that Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein, that we can have a very small part of that virtue. Of course, we can never reach the rank of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, but we can gain a small part of that so that when we follow the Prophet, the Prophet can be proud of us and say that these believers are also from me. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.